our closing comments, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Connie Sutton, uh, who is all very familiar to all of us in this room, long-term Caribbeanist, uh, all over the Anglophone Caribbean and the wider Caribbean, in particular Barbados, uh, um, Professor Emeritus at NYU Anthropology, to come and uh, begin our closing comments and then wrapped up, I, I think, by uh, Professor Ada Ferrer. I'm going to be very short because most of what I had thought I was going to say has been said already. Uh, part of it uh, was said by Antonio when he uh, expanded on what RISM meant, and a part of it was really discussed here. Um, I, I uh, was associated with RISM from its very beginning. And that's why I thought I would tell you just a little bit of it in how I uh, was related to it. I also was associated with the beginning of CLACS. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about that. I will also, um, and I'll try and give you some dates. I'm about 10 years after uh, the People of Puerto Rico project, uh, I was <coughs> I was at Columbia University when Vera Rubin, who got her PhD at Columbia University as a social cultural anthropologist, as I did, um, when she, when her husband, Sam Rubin, who was the maker of Fabergé and therefore made a lot of money at a certain point, um, invested in uh, her having a, well, started in, <clears throat> let me just look for a moment at these notes. I, I forgot my glasses, so you have to be a little patient. Um, I think it was in, 19, um, in 1955 uh, that they set up a, uh, a program called um, the Research and Training in the Study of Man in the Tropics. <clears throat> Uh, I, it was a time when the study of man included women. <laughs> Feminism had not yet got into the academy to correct its vocabulary. And it sent students uh, to do a graduate uh, summer training projects. I was one of the students that was sent to Barbados, and that was 1956. I also then returned, after I passed my PhD exams, uh, to do a, another, um, what was it, 16 months of field work living on a sugar plantation and studying a social uh, pro a process of change. Um, so, and then I also helped edit some of her books, the books that came out. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I am, you could say, a product of RISM, uh, and, um, and RISM, not just its archived material. <laughs> um, also, as I think Antonio mentioned, uh, right after that period, actually starting in something like 1958, 1960, there were a series of, com of uh, conferences that were sponsored by uh, Vera. All of them had to do with the Caribbean and some of the theoretical problems about pluralism and stratification and, and uh, what kind of uh, culture it had and so on. And those c conferences usually brought together uh, West Indian scholars who were raising, who were rising at the time, with uh, um, U.S. scholars who were beginning to do research in the Caribbean uh, beyond Puerto Rico, uh, because her project was tended to be more focused on the West Indies. Uh, she was a student, as Antonio mentioned, of um, Stuart. At least she admired. Uh, his approach, and she tried to take that into the wider Caribbean at a time politically when the Caribbean was itself 
undergoing uh, significant changes uh, toward beginning toward independence. <clears throat> uh, she also, uh, Rizm also, spa okay, so I started teaching at NYU in 1961. And um, she and Rizm, uh, which by that time also had uh, <clears throat> Lambros Comitas, who was one of the graduate students who went to Barbados at the same time I did, and then finished his PhD in Jamaica, uh, he was already part of the, an important part of RISM as an institution. And um, she, at, uh, after I'd been teaching for about 10 years, I decided, oops, I've got, <laughs> I decided to have a conference, uh, which was, I can read it, um, uh, which was financed by African American Studies here at NYU and RISM. And it was entitled The Afro-Caribbean and the Black American Experiences, Comparative, um, I have to read my own thing. Uh, Oh, comparative perspectives. And, it, and Vera uh, provided the other part of the funding to bring over the people from the West Indies and to bring over CLR James, which was a very significant thing. And I actually have here uh, the conference and this, which I don't think <laughs> is in the archives, <laughs> but I will... Um, I will go over this, and I will contribute it to the archives. Um, okay, that was, and that was a very significant turning point where we were bringing the people from these two areas to discuss what their experiences and definitions of racism. Now, um, following that, um, uh, and she went on doing other projects, and uh, at that time, uh, the original training program had shifted and it became RISM independent of the uh, Columbia University Anthropology Department and uh, in its own uh, house and uh, on 72nd Street, as you remember, 72nd? 78th. 70, okay, 78th. And uh, with Lambros Comitas as uh, her initial, let me get this straight, uh, let's see. Oh, he started first as a research associate, and then he, in 65, he became an associate director, and from, and then, uh, and they co they were co-principal, they, they wrote projects, they got funded for projects. Uh, he studied, as you know, a famous study of ganja in uh, Trinidad, and in Jamaica, sorry, and they did things in Bolivia, and they did Peace Corps, so on and so forth. So a lot of things were going on, and there are records of that. I don't know if they're part of this collection. They are, okay. And then he became, <coughs> Uh, associate director, and when Vera died in 1985, he became director and president of the board. That lasted only until 2001 for family reasons of who took over RISM. But he has, I want to use this opportunity to say that he played a very significant role in the collections that were made. And, I, um, and he also, I'm going to pass around, he also took on not only collecting material into the RISM library and being in charge of giving grants to students at CLAX when they for summer uh, training and uh, having fellowships at RISM. It was a central place for upcoming Caribbean students uh, who benefited from the collections there, but also benefited from their fellowships and their scholarships. And his, 
mm, let me just <laughs> uh, go on and, and say. Um, he, uh, a lot of the material that he put together is, and I, I'm gonna pass this out, is, uh, is here. But there's material, significant material, that he has on a website in which I suggest that including the education study that was done in the 1990s, uh, just before M.G. Smith died, and which covers Trinidad, Barbados, and Jamaica. Um, I'm gonna pass this around, which tells you about the databases that he has on his website. He's a professor of anthropology at Teachers College at the present, and unfortunately uh, was unable to come and explain in greater detail much of the material that he has here. Uh, here. And I found going on his database very, very useful, so I wanted to recommend it uh, to you. I, uh, going back a little bit, <clears throat> I, uh, uh, I tell this story uh, about, uh, well, yeah, thanks. Um, I also have material here. I didn't have this reproduced, but I can leave it for reproduction on a report of the various activities of RISM. Um, okay, zero minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I wanna thank uh, Ada very much for putting together this conference. And I also for the book that she wrote, which I think is wonderful. And I wanna say that throughout the years that I've taught here, which is long from what I would say, 61, 62, until um, where I finally stopped teaching was 2001, 2002 or something like that. Um, I've had wonderful Caribbean students who have benefited a great deal, both from CLACS, which I helped create because prior to CLACS, we had here um, what was called uh, the Iberian and Hispanic Studies Institute. And I was getting, because of the change in, in uh, the immigration laws, I was getting more and more Caribbean students in my course. And we went and, uh, to the dean and we said, this cannot go on any longer. We've got to have a Caribbean and Latin American program which has developed and which has become, uh, which I've been associated with and which has become a very important source for Caribbean scholars, for those who want to be Caribbean scholars and for Caribbean people who have populated uh, the here. I also was the first person to introduce a course on the Caribbean at the undergraduate level and that was in the early 70s, um, and the first person to introduce a graduate course in anthropology on the Caribbean, which now Aisha is teaching, right? And uh, I'm just very, very pleased to have this event occur, both for CLACS and also for continuing research, historical research and anthropological research on the Caribbean. Uh, it is, uh, it became not just a field site for me, it became a total enmeshed way of life. Just to tell you that when I went there, I was the only, I, we were the only anthropologists in Barbados to hit the island, it was the first time. I went uh, as a married woman without my husband, worried a bit about how people would feel about that, only to find that they, everybody thought that was fine. The only thing they worried about is I did not yet have a child. <laughs> I had to bring that child back 10 years later. But in any case, my husband, on the other hand, said, my deceased husband said, um, you know, I know when I married you, you were gonna go away and do field work but I didn't think you are gonna bring the whole field back with you, <laughs> which is what happened. And our whole life became involved with and enmeshed in with Caribbean people. And I like it that way. <laughs> okay, 
I'll try. I'll be really brief. Uh, you've been sitting here a long time, and the staff is uh, waiting to give us the reception so that they can go home. So uh, I will be brief. I just wanted to say, uh, just to, to wrap up really quickly, and uh, just remind us that part of what we've been trying to do, or what has gone on, is a, a, a crossing of boundaries in many ways. The crossing of boundaries between anthropology and history, in that we've showcased work of scholars who themselves identify as anthropologists who do historical work, or historians who do anthropologically minded work. Uh, but in some sense, because the subject of the symposium or workshop or conference has been an anthropological archive, the panels necessarily have, have sat at the meeting point uh, between the methods of the two disciplines, so between archival research and ethnographic fieldwork, in that a lot of what we're looking at is notes from eth ethnographic fieldwork. Uh, we've also, you know, on and off, crossed boundaries between the anthropologist and the informant or the subject. We saw that a lot in the, uh, both with the Picabea and the, in the Tasso uh, uh, panels. It came up briefly today. Uh, you know, and it, I just have to, since I've worked most on the Cuba papers, just point out that in the case of the encounter between Withers and Picabea, uh, it, it was a generative, rich encounter, but in some, ironically, it was more generative for Picabea, who ended up producing much more work than he could have ever imagined, right? That 1,500 page manuscript. Meanwhile, Withers went home and couldn't produce a thing. So it was just an interesting uh, inversion. There. It's also, anyway, the conference has also been, uh, has crossed uh, generational boundaries, right? We started with Sidney Mintz, whose work is highlighted in the, in the Puerto Rico part of the collection on display at the archives. And, uh, and we've had s scholars of several generations present, and we have students here who are reading the, the papers in the collection for the first time. So I think that was also part of our, uh, of our of our purpose. And the other thing which has been a little bit harder to do is to cross boundaries within the Caribbean. So in, in our course, we try to always, we try to include uh, British, uh, Caribbean, French, uh, Spanish. Uh, in some sense, the collections that we've highlighted don't le necessarily lend themselves yeah. to that. And so I wanted to end with just a few points of things that haven't come up or that have only come up tangentially that might be areas for further interrogation. And one has to do with that. How do we cross the different uh, Caribbeans? Why doesn't that come up uh, in the documentation? Uh, you mentioned the significance, for example, of the Cuban Revolution in the other Caribbeans. Why, why is that, does that come up in the documents? In the, in the archive, why not? How can we read for that if it doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. Another, uh, another theme is that of migration, uh, which has come up again, just mostly in the question and answer, but I think is really, uh, really critical. We, we talked in the, in the morning panel in Jorge's paper on the comparison between Tasso and Manolo, you talked about the, the, Pentecost, the conversion to Pentecostalism, which is so critical to the end of, of Sidney Mintz's book. Yet the other thing that I always remember, I told my students this about the end of Sidney Mintz's book, is the way that migration comes up and all of a sudden there's all these Puerto Ricans traveling to New York and sending back money. Uh, Ana Vera brought it up in her paper Right, the, in, the, in the newer generations, people either want, you know, earlier wanting to leave the farm, go to the city, or leave the country and, and come elsewhere. So, what? Uh, w and in the and in the and in the British surveys as well, the the, the subject of migration comes up a little bit, not, not as far as I've been able to tell. But what? How can we? Uh, is that an area that could be explored in these collections? Uh, and then the final one is race. I, I had uh, opportunity to interview a man named Luis Ratinov, who served as research assistant to. Carl Withers in London briefly when Carl Withers was trying to come up, figure out a way to produce a manuscript out of all this material. And uh, Luis Ratinov, then in his uh, 80s, said to me that, uh, you know, t this, is, this was in the late 50s, so it was about 10 years after the field work. He said that uh, Withers told him that he had not realized at the time that the most critical element in the whole work and in his field work had been race. And we, we, we didn't really talk about that when we were, when we were talking about the withers Picabea material. So how could we interrogate that further? It came up briefly with Arlene's comment during the Puerto Rico panel. Anyway, so that is all I have to say about, about the conference. I encourage you again, to, if you haven't already, just to check out the exhibit that's in the lobby. It's in the gallery, first, uh, the first floor of Bobes, uh, where all the president's uh, portraits are. Some cases are not this material, but the two cases are towards the window, and they're selected material from all three 
uh, from all three collections. A lot of it's selected by the students in the graduate course on, the, on Caribbean history. And finally, just uh, a round of, of thank yous to, uh, to the staff at CLAX who uh, were terrific, uh, Jen, uh, Jen Lewis, Carolina, uh, and, and Christy, and Marisa, who's been doing the microphone this afternoon, uh, to the NYU archives, and especially Nancy Cricco, who has put up, I'm not, she hasn't put up, she's, she's, uh, she and her staff have treated very well all the people who have, set, who have been using the RISM collections uh, over the last uh, few weeks. And I'd like to acknowledge support from, again, from several sources. First of all, uh, RISM, which is a program of the Reed Foundation, the, uh, the, facu the deans at NYU of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, as well as the dean of the library, Carol Mandel, and the Departments of History, Anthropology, uh, the Program in Africana Studies, and the Program in Public History and Archives. So, and thank you all for, for being here and sharing with us, and we have wine and, and food uh, outside. Thank you. Thank you.